My guest today is Brenda Simmons, and I was on Brenda's podcast just a few weeks ago or a couple weeks ago. Um, Brenda, I'm so happy to have you on. I we we really hit it off, and we had so much to talk about, and I'm thrilled to to be able to continue that. So thank you so much for being here. How are you today? I'm so good, and I'm so happy to be here with you too, Amy. And again, I felt the same way. I it, I just thought our conversation was so much fun, and I'm so excited that we get to continue it again today. Yay! Um, and so Brenda has a podcast, and it is called "Be You: Your Story, Your Purpose." And um, and she it's a newer podcast. How many it episodes is. are you? Yeah, so I have just published my twenty first episode. I started at the very beginning of October this year and, and I'm loving 21. it. Yes, because I put out two a week and um so I've probably got another eight or so in the queue. Um so just trying to build up a little bit so I can take a break over Christmas. <laughs> That's awesome. Wow. And is it not the most fun thing you've ever done? Or maybe I not love ever it. done, but I love it so much. Yeah. <laughs> I like yesterday I interviewed a lady from Vancouver the other, oh, maybe a week or so ago. I interviewed another one in Australia, another one in um, England. I'm like, I, I love networking. And I was telling a friend of mine the other day, like I get to network all over the world now. Like it is a blast. I love it so much. Yeah. And it's not, it's like, yeah, totally. I mean, it is, it's like so fun to get to know people and it's not like, it's not like, um, it's educational, but it's not like super formal. I just, no. there's something about it. That's just so energizing for me. And I, I totally get that, that you feel the same way. And it's, it's amazing to me really the, the, everything that opens up just because of podcasting. Cause when I know when I first started, I was like, I don't even want to push play like or record on this because I know it's not going to be good and I'm going to want to record it like 17 times and it's I'm still not going to be happy with it and he, now I'm just like whatever record <laughs> right I have a mentor um, that said it's okay to first put out B B minus like shoot for that you don't have to be perfect it's just that you will be rewarded with your efforts and you're going to learn as you go and that's totally true my first one I was like Oh my gosh, this is like so yeah. bad. I mean, if you wait I, until you're ready and you're perfect, it's too late. Yeah. It's too late. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so I've made a lot of revisions in just the couple of months, three months that I've been doing it. And, um, but I think that learning process is part of the funness of it. Totally. Yeah. I mean, as you, as you feel more confident, as you talk to more people, you're like, oh, that totally works. Or that was, that was bad. Don't do that again, Amy. Um, right. Something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then, and so be you, your story, your purpose, like what, tell us about that. So when I, when I first decided I was going to do a podcast, I seriously was like, I don't know what to even do one on. I just knew that I needed to. Right. And so I just did a lot of soul searching, you know, what, what is something that I wish that I had had, um, just along my own journey. And I decided that I wish somebody had helped me understand what the point of it all is, you know, what, what is my purpose in the here and now? And so that's what I decided to do was to help people help women to know that, yeah, their purpose it actually is in their own story. They don't have to go looking somewhere else. They don't have to be somebody else. They can be who they are and they can know that the purpose that they are like, not just in the moment, but grandiose, right? Their whole life, they can find that in their own story. They just have to look for it. Right. Absolutely. I mean, and it's so, it's so cool to think that we are all like this puzzle piece in this, this huge puzzle. And if our puzzle piece is not in that puzzle, it's not whole. And so, right. We're all a part of it Yeah, and everybody has value. And, and that's what I love is, is bringing that to life, you know, just to see, okay, in this person's corner of the world, you know, this is how they're making a difference and it's important. And even if that difference is only to themselves, it's important. 
Right. Absolutely. And I mean, everyone and right. And it's all like who you're touching, you know, and like you said, even if it's just yourself, that's, that's important too. But if there's like, if you, you know, you can, you can touch a hundred thousand people. That's awesome. But if it's just one person and you have this loyal person, that's going to follow you forever and just like be your, your favorite, you know, your favorite person on social media or whatever, that's awesome. But the reality is it's never just you, right? You know, like you may think it's just you, but have you ever heard of the butterfly effect? Mm. Okay. So the butterfly effect is it actually, I can't even, there's a book um, written. It's, it is that the title of the book, the butterfly effect. But the idea is that, you know, even the flapping of a butterfly wings, you know, how gentle that is creates a chain reaction that creates something bigger. And, and that's how our lives are. Like we might think that, you know, we're small and insignificant, but the things that we do have a chain reaction and that we can, we have the power of influencing and it, it actually is very powerful. I love it so much. And I think we were talking when, when I was on your podcast about, there are so many people that are like, I, I think it was you that they're like, Oh, I only, I only, um, talk to people who are CEOs or people that are yes. six figures or whatever. Yes. And I was just like, I, that's great. I, you know, there are <laughs> so many, there are so many people that are being missed with these great stories and these lives that are just like dying to be shared. Um, right. And, and I'm it doesn't have to be big. It. Yeah. I loved, I, Amy, I loved so much that you came on my podcast and talked about making jam. I just thought that was so awesome. You know, <laughs> you know, cause it's, it's like, it's just life. Right. And, and everybody's story is different and you know, what impacts them is different. And, um, yeah, what you make of it is inspiring. Right. Yeah. Uh, and there, yeah. And there are so many people, like, I, I think, I can't remember if I told you or not, but I had a guest on my podcast who wanted to talk about, you know, in the sustainability field, like she makes her own broth mm -hmm. and somebody might be like, and, but I mean, if you think about broth, I mean, so she, you know, she's a vegetarian and she, when you're cutting your veggies, you just put a bag of the scraps in your freezer. And uh, so you just keep it in there. And then when you want to make broth, you literally just take that out and you put it in a pot with water. It costs zero. So easy. It costs zero. And then if you buy it at the store, you're getting these cartons that are like $5 a piece. They're coated in what wax or plastic. So you can't compost it. You can't recycle it. You literally have to throw it away. So it's going in the trash and it's adding to the landfill and it's not necessary because you can just use your scraps. Right. You know, I, I'm not vegetarian. So one of my favorite things to do at Thanksgiving, which we just had is to take all those turkey bones and I make my broth out of that, you know, and I, and I love, and we just simmer it and simmer it and I tell you, it's good stuff, you know, and I put like the carrots and onions and, you know, all the veggies that I want to simmer in with it. And it's mm -hmm. just, mm, it is good stuff. Yeah, absolutely. But, and the, the great thing about that is, <clears throat> excuse me, aside from it costing zero, uh, you know, exactly what's in it. You know, there are no Amen. preservatives, there's no chemicals or any, you know, there are no, there's no like plastic or anything coating it. You know, exactly what's in it. Um, so anyway, I just, I just thought that was awesome. And I love that she was so proud of that. And I, yes, I tell that story all the time because I'm just like, go, you go. Okay. I got to tell you this story. So <clears throat> I make my own breads, right? I, I love, I make French bread. I've just gotten into sourdough breads. I do rolls. I do, um, I like to ground my own wheat and make whole wheat bread. So I, I love it. It's totally my comfort food. Um, and I it have a totally really hard, mine too. yes, especially when it comes right out of the oven, like, right. oh my gosh, <laughs> it's like the best stuff ever. <laughs> but, um, my husband bought some hot dog buns. 
Now bread will sit out on my counter and it's good for about a week and then it starts going moldy. And I just know I actually will will cut like just a quarter or a half a loaf because we don't go through it that fast. You know, and I just know that's you know, the rest of it. It's in the freezer, you know, so I work on a little bit at a time. Um, these hot dog buns sat <laughs> in their oh. bag on the counter for three months and we're still good. It's disgusting. Like it, and my husband ate it and I was like, like I was gagging. I'm like, there is no way I would eat that because that is full of junk and so not good for you. You'd be so much better just slicing a piece of my good bread. (laughs) Right. When you, you right, exactly. And when it's always so interesting to me when I read enriched flour or enriched, whatever you're like, what are you enriched with? you know, right. vitamin D or, well, they strip everything and, out. Yeah. Right. And then put it back in. So my favorite is the, um, I love the whole wheat bread. I love the freshness of it. I don't know. I don't know if there is a favorite They're They're all good for different reasons, but, mm-hmm. but yeah, I love the idea of taking the, the kernels and grinding them up and making something really amazing out of it. Mm. Oh my gosh. I don't know how you find the time. <clears throat> Especially with yeah. two podcasts a week. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. And working you now I it's well, part of it is I don't have to do it that often because my kids are grown <laughs> and my husband doesn't eat bread that much. And so we just do it a little at a time. I mean, I just, I don't need to do it that often because it lasts a long, a long time. So when I, when I do a, a batch of whole wheat bread, I'm making five loaves at a time, you know? And so oh, it just goes in the freezer right? and, you know, so it just lasts a while. Gotcha. So it's like once a month, maybe that you do yeah. a batch. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I gotcha. And it's on a weekend. It is. It typically is like on a Sunday when I have time to, to do it. So. Okay. That works. I, that. Thank you. You're I welcome. Feel, I feel better about <laughs> that. Yeah. <laughs> well, anytime uh, you, if you ever need some tips, I'm happy to do it. Oh, careful what you offer. I yeah. <laughs> have tried making bread so many times and it always comes out like a brick and I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I I'm totally lazy about the, the kneading part. Um, and I always look for the recipes that don't require kneading, but I also use like, I tried a bread maker, the machine, mm-hmm. and it also came out like a brick. So I don't know. Wow. Okay. I have a story. Oh, <laughs> yes. So my very first time making bread. I was a freshman in college and I decided I was going to do this because it was my favorite thing. It really was my comfort food and I was missing home. And so I got the recipe from my mom and, and when I first started making bread, like I needed it on the, the counter. Right. Um, but what I didn't realize was that I had killed my yeast and so it didn't rise. So you can over knead it. No, what happened was my water was too hot. So when you put your yeast in, you want just lukewarm to slightly warm water, right? And so um, that's kind of the magic of of getting it going. If your water's too hot, then it kills it. If it's too cold, it won't really activate or it will take a long, long time, right? So I decided, well, maybe it will rise in the oven when it's cooking. That did not happen. (laughs) <laughs> so I had all bread? these, I, well, it was, I, I actually made bricks. Well, I lived on the third floor of my dorm oh. and I decided, you know, these were really strong. <laughs> I wonder how many times it would take for them to break, dropping them off the balcony of my dorm. And, and so we did, I got all my roommates and we dropped this 13 times, 13 times dropping it from three stories. It was powerful. Did you have to go down the stairs every time? Oh, we did. It was, we, and we laughed the whole way. We thought it was so We're in our teens. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) I would not do that now. Not 13 times. Yeah. (laughs) No, but now I have, um, I have a Bosch mixer, which I absolutely love, 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 love. In fact, when I first started using a Bosch, I did a trade out because my husband worked with a guy um, who was divorced and he had a Bosch, but no way to make bread. And so I said, hey, if you let me use your Bosch, I will bake you bread. And so 
that that was a it was a great trade out and I just kept him supplied and bread and I could use the Bosch whenever I wanted. But your tools is what really makes it super good. And so I will stand by my Bosch mixer all day long, every day. So how it's awesome. That, how is that different than a KitchenAid? I'm just curious. Yeah, I, I'm not exactly sure. There is something about that Bosch that when it mixes, it actually warms up the dough. And I don't, I don't know that a KitchenAid really does that, but it's so fast. And sometimes I'll have to take the lid off to cool it off a little bit because it can get too hot. Um, wow. But yeah, it's the mixing is where the art comes in, in, in bread, you know, and, and how much, you know, and I'll, I'll kind of look, I, I know how it's supposed to look. So I look for the texture and how it looks and as you turn it off, it'll kind of look all swirly inside. And, um, it's, and so it's just, I don't know. It's, it's just how it is. I'm getting but, all hungry. I know <laughs> it's good stuff, but yeah, that's, that's the art of the bread making is in the mixing. Okay. Um, yeah, I know part, part of my thing with bread is that I'd hate the, the messy part, like on the counter, the kneading on the counter, mm -hmm. I hate the cleanup part. And so I prefer to not do that. And so I've, I've used like, um, I have like a pie crust. It's like a silicone mat. Oh I yeah. Think. Yeah. Yeah. And it always slides. And so it drives me crazy. And then I've tried like parchment paper and wax and wax paper and like all these things just to try to keep from the counter getting all gross and nothing seems to work. And so I just have to make the counter gross and mm -hmm. it takes forever to clean and oh my goodness. But, um, so I look for the no need, <laughs> I look for the no need recipes. <laughs> And they still come out like bricks. Doesn't matter what I do. Yeah. Um, so I do it's... the I do the quick breads. Yeah. And that I works do the too. That and I do works the brownies too. and the cookies. <laughs> yeah, my my sourdough bread recipe doesn't you don't need to knead it. Well, you still put it out on the counter. I've just got to where, you know, once I'm I always clean my counter really good. And then once I finish kneading it, I just put a whole bunch of water and just let it soak. And then I just take a scraper and scrape it off and it takes me like two minutes. So that's a good uh, tip. Yeah. Cause I'm like trying to, it's all gummy and I'm like, yeah. And then yeah. the, the, the scrubber part of the sponge gets all full of, oh, blah. yeah, that's great. Anyway. Yeah. Well, I actually have a really funny works. story about, um, what I, you go right ahead with yours, but I have a funny story too. Okay. Yes. So I have like a pastry cutter, you know, and sometimes because it's nice and flat. And so you can scrape it because that'll it'll scrape a whole you just anything that, you know, a spatula, like a metal spatula or something like that. Yeah. Um, smart. Yeah, that works out really well. OK, tell me your story. We can smat. Um, I lived in I lived in Utah for a year because you're living in Utah. Right? I'm in Utah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I lived in Utah for one year. Uh, I moved away. Um, and when I was there, I also got homesick. And, um, I think I told you my apple preserve story, right? Yes. Um, yes, so I started, I, I make apple preserves. It's one of my favorite, um, jams from my jam business, uh, currently. And I, my, my story for that is that I was homesick and in Utah, when I was there, at least I could not find apple jelly, uh, in the stores. And so I had my mom send me some. And, um, so it reminds me of my mom every time. And my mom passed away like eight years ago. But, um, so I think of my mom every time I make it and every time I have the apple preserves, but, um, I also, uh, I had this craving when I was there for rice pudding, which I never, I ate it whenever I was with my grandmother, but I was like, meh, sure. But then like, I just had this craving for it when I was there. And so I, I, um, had my mom also send me the recipe for that. And I made this recipe for rice pudding and oh my gosh, it was so amazing. And it made so much. It was like a gallon of milk. <laughs> you don't realize it. <laughs> and then you have to stir it for like, I, I feel like it was like four hours. Cause this was like yeah. 30 years ago, but, yeah. um, and I was, a I've never made anyway. rice pudding. I like I, it. But I, yeah. th I mean, there are so many different ways that you can make it, but my grandmother's was like, you know, there's, there's, it's all love because you're standing in over hot milk for like hours stirring it. So it doesn't scald. Yeah. Um, 
And so you know that there's love in that. <laughs> yeah. Because if you don't <laughs> sure. love somebody, you would not do that. You would not do it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but um, anyway, there was lots of rice pudding for everybody for days. Yeah. Um, but Can you freeze my... that? I probably. Yeah. Probably. Did I? Nope. <laughs> it's just it's like, that's yeah. all you eat. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, shoot, I was 19 years old and um, I didn't have lots of food. I, right. I worked two part time jobs at like four dollars an hour. Oh, isn't that amazing? <laughs> it was crazy. Um, and I ate pretzels because I worked at a pretzel store. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I so I had I ate rice pudding. Uh, but I had it a was good. I had a friend who worked at a sandwich shop when I was in in college and she was totally on her own, made hardly anything. And that's, she lived off of leftover bread from the sandwich shop. Like she, and she would come home with garbage bags full of, I'm not even kidding. Of like the long, the roll, the long rolled yeah. sandwich. Yeah. Yeah. So I worked at a sandwich shop too. Did you? <laughs> in Utah. Yeah. <laughs> what part of Utah did you live in? Um, I lived in Provo. I worked in Orem. Okay, what was the name of the sandwich shop? Blimpy. Oh, okay. And I worked at the Gosh, University they haven't been around Hall, in a while. and I worked at Pretzel Time. Okay. What year were you here? That was an here? awesome job. Uh, 93. I was here then, too. Shut up. Yes. Yes. That's when, yeah, 90, fall of 92, I was a freshman. Yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. So we were we were in the same city at the same time. My yeah. Were you in Provo or Orem? I was in Provo. Crazy. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, that is so cool. Uh, that was it was like the most fun year of my life. Um, but I was very poor. Yes. <laughs> I did not have a car. I took the bus. I walked a mile both ways. <laughs> oh, um, I had my bike. I, I biked everywhere. Everywhere. It was. But you know, that's, that's how it was. It is how, it you know, was. I mean, and it I just, it wasn't a, a big deal. I took a Greyhound bus three days from Maine to Utah to move there. And so I had like a suitcase. With clothes. Right. <laughs> that's what I had. No bike. That's taking a big leap, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was so fun. And I ha I saw the best concerts that year and so many fun movies. Anyway, um, sustainability. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you also make jams and jellies, Brenda. I do. Yes, um, I do. And you make freezer jams and jellies. Yes, I do. Which is very cool. I do not make those because I don't have room in my freezer. You know, for me, that is my grandma story. So my grandma, um, both of my parents grew up on farms in Idaho and, um, my mom's parents sold theirs, but my dad's parents lived like my uncle still lives there. Right. And it's all the farm still in our family, but going up to my grandma's house. And I mean, on a farm, you like the closest town is miles away and there's nothing there because it's so tiny. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember going to my grandma's house and she always had homemade bread and always all, like gallons. And I'm not even kidding gallons of strawberry freezer, freezer jam. And so, so good. Cause she would have this massive strawberry patch. And so she'd go out and she'd pick all of her strawberries oh, on her farm much. and then she would make the jam out of it. And that was just, uh, just another comfort food. Um, but and then once my once I got on my own, I was like, I want to learn how to do that because I had done other like the cooked jams, but I just like the freshness of the freezer jams best. And um, so I started doing other kinds. I I do blackberry. My favorite actually is raspberry. I love raspberry freezer jam. It's so good. Mm, everybody loves raspberry jam. Yeah. I don't know that I've had raspberry freezer jam, but you said that your son's favorite is dandelion jelly. Okay. Is it yes. Jam or jelly? It's jelly, right? Because it's, mm, it I guess it would be a jelly because you don't have any fruit 
quote right, unquote. Right. In it. So yeah, I, it's not my favorite, but I actually learned about this at a library program. I was, I went to the library and they were teaching about preserving and making things. And they had this recipe there for dandelions or dandelion jam. And my kids were real little and I just thought it would be a really fun family activity. Let's go out and pick dandelion flowers. I mean, who doesn't want you to come out and pick those dandelion flowers, right? Right. And so, but I thought, okay, we've got to be, it's got to be in a field with a lot of them because I know they haven't sprayed, right? And so I just, I would let my kids loose and they had so much fun. And what you do is just you basically, I know, let them loose. Just Free take range. as many yellow flowers as you want. <laughs> so you, you boil the flowers. I mean, the whole dandelion plant is edible, right? Mm-hmm. It's just the, the greens are real bitter, but you boil the heads of the flowers and, um, and you put honey in it. So to me, and I think there's lemon. I haven't, I haven't made it in years. Cause again, it's not my favorite, but, um, so, you know, if mom doesn't like it, right. right? <laughs> it doesn't mom get has a little bit of pull. Yeah, exactly. But, um, it kind of tastes like a, like a honey lemon cough drop is what I think it tastes like. So, so not, mm. not like the most. You're flavorful. selling that good, Brenda. I know, so good. You you understand now? It's not my favorite, <laughs> but my son has this flair for really different flavors, right? And so he just he absolutely loved it. So I'm like, hey, you go, kid. You can have all of this. You eat your cough drop jam. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh my gosh, you should teach him how to make it and say. You can pass this on to your kids now. Yeah. Oh, I will definitely pass that that on to him. So, <laughs> but I mean, I know that I my um my cousin's daughter makes a uh, dandelion honey. So oh, interesting. It's also called called poor man's honey, I think. Um. So it's 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 honey consistency, and it looks like it just looks really like honey. Yeah. Is it just like reduced or something? She made it. I didn't make it. <laughs> I don't really, I don't really like honey. I feel, I feel so bad saying that because I like, I'm friends with a lot of people that do honey, but I don't like it. Is um, it just too sweet? I just, just I, the flavor. I just don't like the flavor of it. Mm, yeah. And I, I still, I mean, I use it when I make um, elderberry syrup and yeah. Um, When I make things, I'll make things with honey, but I can't, I just can't taste it. Yeah. Well, and honey has, there's a lot of different flavors of honey. Like if you go up, there's a place called Bear Lake up here in Northern Utah. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but they are well known for wild raspberries. And so the honey there has a raspberry flavor to it. It's actually really, really good. Oh, yes. I think they may even put like some raspberries in it, but I don't, I don't know because it's red. So I, they probably do, but it's good stuff. Mm-hmm. Cool. <clears throat> um, and so let's see, so you are in Utah, but you li- you grew up in Montana. Nope. Bay area, California, in the middle of the city. Okay. The, you, there was an M. Well, then after we so my husband and I were married and we lived in Arizona and then we moved to Missouri. Missouri. And that's really where my kids grew up was in Missouri. Yeah. Okay. There was an M. I think. Yeah. You were right. Okay. <laughs> okay. But you grew up in California. Yes. Okay. And that was the city. So you mm-hmm. grew up in the city and then you lived in the the rural the um agricultural area. Yeah. Okay. I fell in love with small town America though, when I was in college, cause I did, um, I did an internship for the Utah division of wildlife resources down in this little town called Ephraim, Utah population, hardly anything, um, except for there was a junior college there. And so you'd have this influx of college kids, but the residents, there weren't that many. And it was one of those little towns where everybody would say hi with the you know, they'd be driving down, you know, and they'd say hi oh, with a oh, finger, oh, yeah, right? Yeah. Hey, <laughs> right. 
right? Oh, that was so fun. Okay. And I see, I, I love people do that in Maine. I think with their, it's like, or I don't, how do you, I'm trying to, yeah, it's like part of your hand or something. Right. Right. So, but I just love the quaintness of it. And, you know, I love getting to know the people who lived there. And I just thought, man, this is so amazing. Like I just felt such a connection to earth, you know, and I mean, it certainly helped that I, the job that I was working in, but, um, yeah, I just, I loved it. I just thought I don't ever want to live in the city again. Of course I'm there, but here I am, (laughs) here I am. Right. (laughs) That's life. (laughs) Oh gosh. It's funny how we do that. I mean, I, I totally, um, I call myself a wannabe farm girl, but I'm, I like, I'm such a fair weather farmer. People have said, oh, you should get a job working for a farm and like gardening and stuff. I'm like, no, you don't understand. I don't like sweating. I don't like bugs. I don't like weeding. Like, I don't, I don't like all those things. I nobody would want to hire me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard work. Yeah. It's really hard work. Is, is Maine humid? Yes. It is right. Well, and that adds a big factor as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I do not like the humidity. I don't like, yeah. heat. I don't like the bugs. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, that's, that's, um, that would not be a good job for me, but I totally can appreciate, uh, I, I miss the, I do miss the dry temps, <laughs> the dry weather in Utah. Yeah. Yeah. Having low humidity, like you don't know what that is like until you try it and it's pretty amazing i will have to say right (laughs) um i'd love to hear more about that that internship though that sounds really cool Um, yeah so i i actually have a degree in wildlife and um that was kind of a funny story. I grew up camping and my dad would take us on backpack trips and stuff like that. And when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life, I went to the career center and said, I cannot work at a desk. And so they gave me, I'm not kidding, like a three inch volume of jobs that are not desk, like an jobs. encyclopedia, right? It was literally like reading a, um, a dictionary. And so I came to this one that said forestry, a person who takes care of the forest or whatever it said. And I thought that sounds like fun. I will do that. What degree requires the least amount of chemistry that I'm in? <laughs> so that's, that's how I decided. My degree. And I love so, that. so, and practical. I went, I know totally like I knew what I, what I wanted, right? These are my boundaries. Right. And, um, but part of that, I did several internships. And so my first internship was working down in Ephraim for the Division of Wildlife Resources. And it was really cool because we would go out into the um, the forest and like on or was it BLM, Bureau of Land Management land, right? Not Black Lives Matter. This is this BLM was there first. Um, and so we'd go out onto all of like these state owned lands and we would do studies like plant studies on areas that had been either burned or had been chained. So um, like if they're trying to control like an invasive species, sometimes they'll take these big long chains um, attached to two tractors and they'll drag that chain and kind of just, you know, dig up the ground and, and pull up some of these, the plants that they don't want there. Oh, wow. And yeah. And so we would go back and um, do these plant studies and count, literally counting the plants that were in, you know, a specific area. And um, so, so this is some, like after they dug the invasive plants uh-huh. out, you're like yeah, counting and, what's left over? Yep. Well, not not like immediately. Like we would go back like a year later and some of the places were like, five years later, you know? And so, so that, and that every year they would go back to see how, you know, what was the difference in how things grew up. And so we had these grids that we would put on specific places so that it was the same spot, you right. know, every single time. And, oh um, we would just count our little hearts away. But part of that was, I had to know what the plants were. And so, um, 
part of that came from obviously education with my degree, but that was really fun to be able to go out in the world and, and actually see it, yeah. you know, in person. Totally. So, so that was that job. And then I had a few more internships with the forest service. So one I worked out of Evanston, um, another one I worked out of like, um, like Heber, Utah. So, um, yeah, that was, that was super fun. That one I did jobs on, we did like, um, hawk. So it's occipiter, um, goshawks studies and, and three toed woodpecker studies and because they were, um, sensitive species. So they were trying to figure out where they're, where they were and so that they could determine, you know, their population and stuff like that. So, that was, I really loved doing that. That one was cross country stuff too, but it was by myself cross country. So that was, huh. uh, we would, yeah, we would go up to a certain spot and rather than having like a specific area, we would take like a, a, a transect line, you know, with a compass and we had maps and then aerial photos and we would just go in a straight line. It, it always reminds me of, um, this is so dumb, but, <laughs> um, have you ever seen the movie Better Off Dead? No. Okay. I think I've I've decided that this was like a cult classic from where I grew up in California. It was made in the 80s. It is a very, very funny movie. And I have so many quotes that I still quote <laughs> because it's just one of those movies. Um anyway, so in, in that it out movie. This weekend. Yeah. So in that movie, the um the main guy has to be in this um, skiing competition. Right. And so he's got his sidekick that says, go that way really fast. And if anything gets in your way, turn. Right. And so I I always think of that go one way, (laughs) not necessarily really fast, but one way. And if anything gets in your way, turn. Right. So it was was, like, I just would always think about that. So, um, but that's kind of how it was, but yeah, I saw some really, really cool things because I, it was off trail and I was out there all by myself. And then we, I had a partner who was, who would do it just on a different line. And so then we'd meet up and, but yes, yeah, some really, really beautiful places in the world. So it was cool. That's awesome. I mean, that's, I love stuff like that because there's so that's, it's like a whole different, um, angle. I've talked to a bunch of people on the podcast about stuff like that. Like there's this girl who is, um, she is sailing the world with her significant other and, um, and they're like studying, I say studying, but like they're, they're noting where the sustainable places are. Uh, and, and this guy, um, Noah has a climbing and guide service. And, uh, and I just, I love, I love following stuff like that because there's, there's so much to be said for finding awe and like just Mm -hmm. appreciating nature for what it is. And knowing that because you can appreciate that, because you can see that, you know, feel that awe that you're going to take care of that. Um, And so for, in, in that sort of vein, you would be, you know, taking better care of it. So you'd be more sustainable, but, um, absolutely. I just love, I love just the idea of finding awe in life and in the world. Um, I think it's so important to be able to do that and not just be like, "Mm, yeah, there's some leaves. Right. Well, and I I think it takes noticing, right. I'm, you know, I'm, I mean, things become so commonplace that we no longer quote unquote, see them. Right. I remember we moved here um, from Missouri and, you know, Missouri is rolling hills. You know, there's no mountains there. I mean, they say there are, but they, they really don't, <laughs> they don't compare to the Rockies, know you know, mountains. and where I'm at. <laughs> I, know, it, I think Maine is the same way. We're like, oh, mountains, like. Yeah, exactly. Have you so, been over here? Yeah. Have you seen these mountains? Have you seen these yeah. Mountains? Exactly. So when we moved here, I mean, the mountains where I live are just huge, you know, Uh, you've lived here. So, you know, like they're, it's different, you know? And I just remember saying, I want to never lose the awe for the mountains. 
you know, and I, and, but what I've noticed is it takes intentionally looking, you know, and, and noticing the details. Oh, you know, when the sun is coming up and, and you see not only the, the color of the sun on the mountains or, but it's the shading, you know, or it's the, you know, how, how they look at sunset. And, you know, when you see earth's, my favorite is when you've got the snowy mountains and it's dusk. And so, you know, you've got earth's shadow that comes after the sun has set. Right. And so it's this really, really dark blue, but it's not Navy yet, you know, and it's just, just stunning. So yeah. stunning, but yeah, it it's intentionally looking and observing and feeling it, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, totally. Oh my gosh. <clears throat> This is so awesome. I know you have a, you have a concert, so I don't, I don't want, I want to respect that, but, um, I, I just love what you're doing and you have so much passion for it. It's, it just like comes right out of you. Uh, and so, so you're making bread and you make jam and you, you have this history with the, the internship and what are you doing now, Brenda, that are you working at a desk? Um, I am just shop now. <laughs> well, I, I'm doing a lot of different things. I, I'm a realtor, so that gets me up and moving around and, um, meeting people and, and whatnot. Um, I do my podcast. I'm also a life coach and I'm getting that business started. And I've got a friend who lives out in Missouri and we're working on starting up a couple of other dis- different businesses. So my, I've got a lot of fires going, <laughs> you know, so, but it, it, the, the mental challenge is really fun for me. I love being able to figure things out and putting the puzzles together and making things come alive. It's, it's really, really fun. That's so cool. But uh- what's interesting though, is if I am too mo- too long at my desk, I have to have some mountain therapy, you know, or at least go on a walk along a river or, you know, I've got to get out and just recalibrate. And um, yeah, I, if I, if I stay away too long, it's harder in the winter, you know, because it does get so cold, but, but I still at least take my dog for a walk. You know, it's just that recalibration of just being outside and again, just looking and being observant and, and feeling like I am a part of the earth, you know, and that to me is, is really, really important. Hmm. That's so cool. That's really cool. I mean, I think that's, and that just makes you feel, it just makes you feel so connected. And that is so, it's so important to feel that. Absolutely. Well, it is. And there's this dichotomy of, you know, I am, you know, I am in my own universe, in my own world, like I play a big role, right? But at the same time in the universe and in the world, I'm very small. And so feeling both of those at the same time, I don't know there's something about that that's really really grounding. Mm. Sure. Uh but then still even though you're a small part you're an important part. Yes. Mm. Absolutely. Mm. Cool. Um I love that. Thank you. You're welcome for that. <laughs> <laughs> um so Brenda when I say the word sustainability to you what does that mean? Well, it reminds me of when I was back in school and, you know, there was always this difference between conservation and preservation, right? Preservation was don't touch it. You know, you, you just leave it the way it is. Whereas conservation meant more, we're going to use the land, um, in a very responsible way so that we can use its bounties and also, and also make sure that other people can use it as well. And, and so to me, sustainability really takes on more of that conservation Mm. um, feel to it where, you know, we're able to take advantage of what the earth has to offer because 
she does offer an awful lot. And that is what it's there for, right? I'm not saying we should never preserve because I think there's a time and a place for that. But to sustain, you know, to have that sustainability means you are going to be using it, you know, and and you are going to harvest the bounties, so to speak, you know, not just in farming, but in other places too, but then making sure that that is there for other people behind you. So I used to teach, um, leave no trace to, um, scouts and girl scouts and and different things like that. And the, the principles of leave no trace are to make it look as if you were never even there. Right. And so I love that because it's, it, it, again, you, it, it makes you look at how you are impacting where you've been and then taking note of, okay, how can I make sure that other people are able to use this land the way that I have been able to, because I got it when it was really nice, you know, or improving it. Right. 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 Yes. And I, I totally, I totally get that. And I always sort of have that, that same mindset of like, leave it better or, you know, at least as you found it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, And I don't know, I don't know where that came from for myself, but I, I can totally appreciate that. Like let someone else enjoy it as you did. Um, Right. Right. That's very cool. Um, and I, I never really thought about that preservation versus conservation. I never considered the difference. That's really interesting. Yeah. They're okay. both important for different reasons. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for that. You're so and welcome. Then, and so um, I definitely want people to check out uh, the podcast. So um, be you, your story, your purpose, check out uh, Brenda's podcast and how else can people find you or follow you if they want to hear more from you? So I'm on Facebook primarily. I do hop on Instagram. Um, they can find me there. I'm at, um, Brenda Beams Simmons. So B E A M E S, um, is my maiden name. So, um, you can find me there. I, I also do links to because I'm just getting started on my podcast. I don't have all my social media stuff up for that yet. Um, so I do have a presence on social media with that, but it's more, I'm just kind of dropping the link kind of a thing. Um, but yeah, you can always find me on my social media or you can even email me at Brenda T Simmons at gmail.com. Oh, the email, the email. Yes. Awesome. Okay. Very cool. Well, thank you so much, Brenda, for sharing that. I, that's so so great. I just love it. I love hanging out with you. I know. I wish we lived closer. <laughs> We'd have a lot of fun. <laughs> you know, Utah is Utah is on my bucket list. I know I've I lived there for but I you know, I was working part-time jobs and I had no money. I had no car. I had no bike. I right. You're like the laser bikes. focused on surviving. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. I didn't see much. But um yeah, I definitely want to get back there. So um you you might just see me. All right. All right. If you ever are here, give me a ring. Awesome. Okay. Thanks again. And uh, everyone definitely check her podcast out and um, we'll see you next time. Awesome. Thank you, Amy.